Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wristwatch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, I've got an Elgin pocket watch. This one dates to 1919 and it belongs to, uh, well, a friend and supporter actually of this channel. And um, he asked me if I could take a look at this watch. It belongs to his grandfather. And as you can see, this thing's awesome. This is a fairly typical watch for the era. They made a million of these things. In fact, of this model, they literally made over a million of them. I looked. But the cool part is, is look how worn this watch is. And I don't mean in bad shape. I mean used. Like this was carried in somebody's pocket for years and years. You can see the plating's pretty much gone on the outside. The crystal has a big crack on it. After a little bit of a wind, it does run. So that's kind of amazing right there. And uh, there were some dents on the back and ugh, the back's really hard to get off of this thing. I want to see what the movement looks like inside. But this watch has had a life. This is not one that's been sitting. This one was used. And let's take a look at what the movement looks like inside. Ooh, it's pretty. Ah, oh, these, these pocket watch movements were so gorgeous. Everything's kind of fully on display, right? Like you can see it really well. And as you can see, it is running. So that's a good start for us as well. We'll get an idea for how well it's running in just a little bit. I want to take a a look at things here as we continue to disassemble the outer part of the case. The front bezel screws off on a watch like this. And as I mentioned, that crystal's done. But uh, even hazy and kind of dirty, removing it reveals the dial, which looks like it's in really good shape. These were enameled dials, which was kind of the only way that they did it back in the day. That's why you see so many pocket watches with that kind of classic white look with the uh, with black numerals of some sort. Sometimes they're Roman numerals. We'll start by removing the hands. The minute and the hour hand are together. Hmm, that's weird, look at that. The hour hand's actually split, it looks like. And that actually looks like it may have been done on purpose. We'll have to investigate that down the line because that probably means that these were replacement hands and that the watchmaker had a hard time fitting it on to the uh, hour wheel, and they may have cut it in order to expand it a little bit so that it would actually fit. Second sand can come off now. This was an era before watches routinely had center second hands where the second hand was on the middle post. They were almost always um, separate. Taking a look at the back of the case here is kind of interesting too. It's got this kind of shooting star looking thing with a circle at the end of it. And that is a wear pattern that I've never seen before. So I'm gonna see if it maybe matches up to something on the movement. So this looks like the spot where that circle is. And what happens if I line it up with maybe one of these screws? Because it actually looks like a screw head <laughs> kind of indented in there. So if I line it up, oh, it's that, see right there where it's marked, it's that. So it's this screw sitting on top of the ratchet wheel is actually making contact with the case back. That can cause, well, you know, various types of issues. It also may not cause any at all besides the wear. But that's something that I'm gonna have to look into. But in the meantime, we can decase the watch and take out the dial. As you can see, the dial actually has a layer of, in this case, orange enamel on the back. And they do that because enamel actually has to be heated in a kiln until it melts. And the problem is if all the enamel is on the front side of a piece of metal, that side will get hotter and it'll actually curl the metal enough to crack the enamel. All right, let's put this thing on the time grapher and get an initial reading and see what we're working with. Because we can see that it's running, but how well? Oof, not great. Uh, you can see pretty low amplitude, although the rate's actually okay. The beat air is off quite a bit. Um, so we this thing's gonna need a tune-up for sure, but this is promising. This watch is running and actually reasonably, although the amplitude's really low. So let's see what we can do with it. We'll start by removing the balance. 
It's always a pleasure working on these pocket watches because they're so big that you can just see everything. They're relatively simple for, for watches. There's no dates or anything like that on them. Also, the level of finishing is quite high, especially given that, you know, this wasn't a super fancy pocket watch or anything. This was a pretty standard issue type watch that you would get. When this, when this watch was made in 1920, wristwatches weren't even a thing yet. They technically existed, but nobody wore them. And when they first got marketed, they were marketed towards women. They called them wristlets. And they, weren't, and they were considered pretty unmanly. Just a few short years later, though, um, after World War I, you know, which is right around this time here, um, enough soldiers had worn wristwatches in the war where they were very practical, you know, when you're uh, in trench warfare, having a pocket watch uh, that you might sit down in or crunch up against something isn't where you want to be. So they put it on their uh, on their wrist and it was much more handy. And, it, and the men came back and had watches like that. And it started to become, uh, I guess, socially acceptable for men to wear pocket watches and they or excuse me to wear wrist watches and they've really never looked back. Which is part of the reason why you can find pocket watches for an absolute bargain on eBay. If you're looking to get into the hobby, that's what I recommend starting with. Taking apart the top of the barrel bridge here, the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel come out. You can see some wear spots there underneath. That's pretty typical for a watch of this age. And now I can take off the barrel bridge as well. And just checking for wear and just sort of giving a, you know, general inspection idea. Take the barrel out now. And this is the keyless works, the winding stem. It's obviously a little bit of a different setup than, uh, than to a wristwatch where the stem and the crown are attached to each other in one piece. But, uh, well, you can see the similarities if you... Oh, well, if you've watched a bunch of my videos, <laughs> you'll probably go, yeah, that looks kind of familiar. You can flip the watch over and take off the Canon pinion with boom, my Canon pinion removal tool. I love this thing. Makes my life very easy. It was well worth the, I think, 45 bucks I spent on it. I did have to uh, restore it. It wasn't working very well, but I took it all apart, put some grease in there. I made a new thumb thumb grip thing for it. And I've used it ever since. As you can see, these watches are very straightforward. We're actually almost done disassembling it at this point. This is the pallet fork bridge and the pallet fork coming out. Flipping the watch back over, we can take out the rest of the keyless works, which have two beautiful springs here. You see that kind of three quarter circle spring? Really cool. They don't make them like that anymore. There we go. And then this part is actually the yoke with a yoke spring built into it. And I'm kind of figuring out how it works, right? Because this isn't how uh, wristwatches are set up exactly. It's similar, but it's not the same. And so sometimes I have to kind of play around with the parts a little bit to go, okay, what is what, is what here? And I'll continue with the disassembly. And that should just fall out the bottom. There we go. And as you can see, there's one other part here. To, uh, to take off before we've got this movement disassembled. Now we can turn our attention over to the mainspring barrel. And we'll take a look at the mainspring and see how it looks. Curious to see if it's the original or, or at least one from a bygone era or if it's been replaced more recently. But my guess is that it hasn't. Uh, this watch doesn't look like it's been serviced in forever. And yes, confirmed. It's got that kind of brown color. 
also um, it's concentric circles coming out basically, which is how they used to make mainsprings. Now they actually have a sort of reverse S shape at the end that uh, aids in performance. But otherwise it looks pretty clean. Not that bad actually. The spring's kind of messed up though. You can see it's sitting strangely high and has some kinks in it. So it's probably not performing perfectly. All right, so for now, let's put the uh, let's put this in the dust cover before we get it into the watch cleaning machine in just a little bit. And once again, I'll put the balance back on the bridge and just make sure that I've got it seated correctly with a little puff of air. And I do. Always put everything in these uh, dust trays just to make sure. All right, so let's put this thing into the watch cleaning machine. This is gonna go through a three-stage cycle. And while I do, I wanted to mention my Patreon. I've got a Patreon for this channel. And if you like what I'm doing here, you can head over to patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. It's in the show notes as well down below. And I wanna say uh, thanks to everybody who supports me over there. I really do appreciate it. It allows me to continue to uh, build this channel and make these videos and it means the world to me. As you can see, the watch cleaning machine goes through what ends up being four stages. It goes through a clean two rinses and a drying cycle. And that's why I have to use a paper towel because it's hot. <laughs> Here's what the watch looks like completely disassembled and kind of in order as well. Really, it's not that much. It, this is what I'm saying. If you want to get into the hobby, this is where you should start because you'll be able to get your head around that. Taking a look at this mainspring though, I'm not really liking it. Um, I don't think that it is... Uh, going to perform optimally. It would work again. It's not that. I just don't think it's in great shape. So I bought a new one. Now I do have to wrestle with this a little bit because I couldn't find one that fit the exact measurements of that mainspring that happens sometimes. So I had to get one that was, uh, for lack of a better term, like one, like a half size up. Uh, it should fit in the barrel, no problem, but it is a little bit stronger of a spring. And not 100% sure how that's going to affect the watch, so we'll just have to find out. But uh, it should last for for basically the rest of the watch's life because they're they're made with alloys. You know, when they came out, they actually called them unbreakable mainsprings, which is which is nonsense. But uh, they are very difficult to uh, to break. Movement looks good and clean now out of the watch cleaning machine, and we can start our reassembly journey with this watch. We'll start with the train of wheels. That's the escape wheel. I was really happy to get an opportunity to work on this watch. I, I just mentioned the Patreon a minute ago. And uh, this watch actually belongs to my first patron on this channel. He's somebody who's been a, a supporter of, of my endeavors um, in content. I've, you know, my, my kind of other job is doing uh, content in the gaming space and, and he's always supported me over there. And when I first put up the Patreon for this, you know, it was just kind of just getting rolling. And, uh, and I saw, oh, I got a patron. This is really cool. And I saw the name and I was like, wow, uh, just, it meant so much, you know, especially for the size of the channel at the time, I was really just kind of getting it going. And uh, when he asked me if I could work on his grandfather's pocket watch, I said, Yes. Yes, I can. All right. So let's get the, uh, the wheels in place here. As you can see, it's uh, kind of like a, a waterfall of wheels. <laughs> it start, starts off with the big one on the right there and then kind of cascades down to the little escape wheel at the end. I don't know, that's how my brain processes it anyway. Okay, so that looks like it's all set up. Now, the bridge setup for this watch is actually really keen. I, I think it's really cool. So this bridge covers the barrel, but it also covers the center wheel and the third wheel, as you can see there on that middle slope of the bridge. And that means that the train wheel bridge actually only has to cover two things, which is the fourth wheel and the escape wheel. So it kind of splits it out. When, you, when you're putting back together a watch, and by the way, watch this, there we go. See, I'm looking for that right there. I want the bridge to sit down so those pivots can get through, and then I can tighten down the bridge. And with 
you know, three of them taken care of, only two left on this, it makes it a lot easier. You want these to be split. The more pivots that you have to get lined up, the more difficult it is. If you've ever seen a, a popular German style of watches, one they call a three quarter plate, and that one will actually cover all of those pivots. <laughs> the only thing it doesn't cover usually is the balance. So that is, that's a lot. And there we go. Again, a little bit of fiddling, but we'll check it to make sure. And yep, it looks like the wheels are spinning nicely here. So that's good news. And I can start putting back on the, uh, the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel now. And I can even give it a little test wind here though. It won't hold that wind because there's nothing holding it back. If the pallet fork was in place, then it would hold that wind in place. That's actually what the job of it is. When you think about it, it's kind of interesting because what the whole watch is really doing is, is letting you wind up that big mainspring all the way, ton of energy stored in it. And then what it's really doing is allowing that energy to be, re be released in very specific increments. And as long as those increments are accurate, you can attach wheels and gears and things on to drive hands, uh, you know, at the appropriate speeds, as long as that power is being released in very specific increments. In cases like this watch, that would be uh, 18,000 times per hour. Okay, got a bit of an issue here. So I was kind of happily cruising along and I'm like, wait a minute, what about the keyless works where the winding stem is? And I realized that it actually goes in on this side of the watch, not the other, like would be on a wristwatch. So that means I have to undo the work that I just did. Thankfully, not all of it. I can leave the train wheel bridge on there, but the, um, but the barrel bridge has to come off with the ratchet wheel, the crown wheel, and now I can get in here and start to put the keyless works back together. But this is just a thing that happens sometimes when you're not used to working on a movement. Um, it's put together differently, you know, than, uh, than the vast majority of movements that I've worked on. And uh, you kind of have to expect that on some level, right? That uh, you're not just gonna remember every single thing perfect every time. It just tests your patience a little bit right? You just need to be like, okay, I need to undo this. And I'll tell you, this is one of my favorite things about watchmaking because I'm the type of person that will <laughs> try to look for a shortcut. Oh, maybe I can just sort of slide this thing under here and not take off this part and I'll save myself some time. I don't know why my brain works like that. It always has. And watchmaking says, no, you are going to have to just take off those wheels, take off that bridge, and you're going to have to deal with it. And, uh, you know, I've used it as a way to try to kind of train myself to avoid that uh, temptation of just trying to take a shortcut and trying to do things properly. And I still fall for it every once in a while. But generally speaking, it really does help. I think over time, like you, I start to uh, kind of catch myself and go, no, 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 no. You're going to have to redo this. You know, I'm really sorry <laughs> that those 20 minutes are going to go away, but, uh, but you know, that's part of the deal. Okay. So now I've got those keyless works parts back in place and I can continue with the rebuild. So once again, we'll put the, uh, the barrel bridge on as well as the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel. Remember that a lot of times the crown wheel screws are reverse threaded. That was actually the case here as well. You wouldn't think it's a big deal. Uh, when you're putting the screw back on, it's not because you can screw it the wrong way all you want. It just won't engage. But when you take the screw off, it is a very big deal because you will think, well, this thing's really tight. And so you're going to push harder and harder and harder. And it's not that hard to uh, shear the head of the screw off if you're you know, really cranking on it. Okay, we can put the back of the keyless works into place here as well. 
I just love the design of these springs. They're so beautiful. This is one of those kind of form follows function type things. It looks really cool, but you know, it was also designed for a specific job and it does a good job of it as well. Always fascinated to think that they made these parts, all, every part on these watches, you know, in the 1800s, this was in the early 1900s. But I mean, they, how? How did they make these parts? It's incredible to me. I did look it up, by the way, because I was like, how do they make those little tiny screws back then? And it's kind of funny. The answer is they use a huge machine. <laughs> it's just a massive machine. But it's a automated milling machine. And it actually can mass produce like small things like this where it just makes buckets of them. Okay, pallet fork in, just a quick check to make sure it's engaged properly. And that means that we can try out the balance. And let's see if this thing wants to go. It was running before, I expect it to run again. But it's being a little bit hesitant. It seems to be spinning freely, but just not really engaged much. But as long as it's sitting correctly, okay, it looks like it's actually trying to go. Why don't we uh, make sure that the balance bridge is properly screwed down first. And then we'll see if we can get this thing to run, run. A little kickstart. Yeah, there we go. That's the business. Beautiful blued hairspring there as well. And it looks like it's running pretty strong. Okay, so what do we need to do next? That's right. We need to oil the jewels. So a little bit of Mobius 9010. This is our lightest viscosity oil. And it's meant to just suspend itself between the, the red ruby jewels that you see there and the pivot. That's why you don't want to like fill that whole cap up. You just want a little bit. Here I'm using HP 1300, which is a little bit thicker of an oil. That's kind of on the slower moving bigger parts, I guess is how I describe it. Okay, looking good. This is more HP 1300, again, that medium viscosity oil. This is actually on the bottom of the barrel. That's where it meets up. That's a very slow moving part. And yes, the last thing we need to do is to balance jewels. The problem is this is old school. There's no shock setting on these. Shock setting is, is the thing that protects the balance pivots from breaking. <laughs> it also makes it a lot easier to service watches because you can simply open up the top of them like I do on my other videos and then remove the jewels from there. Unfortunately, this watch was made before they invented those, uh, at least before they were used in mass production. There were a few inventions. Uh, Breguet had one called a parachute. There's a few others, but it wasn't until you know, a good 20, 30 years later before you actually saw them in mass production. And that means I need to completely disassemble the balance. So I have to start by taking off the whole balance wheel. This is quite a project just to get these things clean, but it's really important to how well the watch runs. And given how low the amplitude was on the time grapher, this is not something that we can, we can skip this time. So this is how you do it. You have to take off these two little tiny baby screws and that reveals that uh, chaton you see there. That's that brass fitting with the jewel on it. That's a cap jewel. It's flat on the bottom. And then below that, there's what they call the hole jewel. So that has a hole in it like any of the other jewels. And the, uh, the pivot rests inside that hole jewel. And to take it out, I just need to simply push it out the top here. Like that. So there should be two pieces in here. Let's take a look. There we go, there's two of them, a cap jewel and a hole jewel. And these are gonna to need to be cleaned and lubricated before we can uh, continue with this rebuild. So take a look at this. You can maybe see already just how gunky it is. It's kind of hard to see through it, ooh yeah. So that's all dried on oil on the top. There's that 
spot in the middle as well. So whoop, these need to go in a solvent. This is called one dip. And it's a solvent that will help dissolve that old oil and dirt. Any of that oil and dirt on there can help, or I should say hinder the performance of the watch pretty significantly. So I'm actually going to use some peg wood here to just gently get in there and kind of scrub the top of that jewel to make sure that there's no more dried on oil or anything like that. And let's see if we can't take a look at it. There we go. See, that's what we want. We want that mirror finish. And now I can take a little bit of oil, just that much. And that is going to sit on top of that whole jewel, which I am going to replace right now. And uh, it'll suspend that oil right where it needs to be for the balance to perform optimally. Now, this is some tricky business. So I have to take this cap jewel and I have to reinstall it on the top here, but I can't have that oil actually touch the sides because it'll just get pulled away and it won't sit properly. So this is okay, but I really need this to kind of fall in without touching the edge. There we go, like this. That is what I needed to happen. Otherwise, it kind of sucks because you have to start over. But it looks like I got it, so I'm really happy with that. And now the little tiny screws get to go back in. And those will keep the, the fitting in place, the setting in place, I should say. And there goes the other one. Okay, and now I need to reassemble the entire balance. So that means putting the balance wheel with the balance spring back on. Like this. There we go. And I can just screw this part back on and make sure that the spring is back realigned with the stud. And uh, that'll be a done deal. Now, we've also got <clears throat> the bottom, right? There's, there's the same type of setup on the bottom. It's built into the, the plate here, but as you can see, it's the same thing. I unscrew these two screws, then I can push out the setting that has the two, the cap jewel and the hole jewel, and I'm gonna clean re-lubricate and reinstall those as well. I'm just gonna use some peg wood here to uh, extract those jewels and there they are. Curious to see how dirty these ones are. And they look like they're about as dirty as the other ones. So we'll give them the same treatment. We'll put them in some one dip, swirl it around a little bit try to dissolve as much of that oil as we can. I'm gonna grab the pegwood once again and just give it a little, again, it's just like a little manual abrasion, right? Just to get any of the extra stuck on gunk. I mean, that oil, when it dries, it, it really becomes pretty crusted on. Let's take a look at what we got now and see if we, clean it up. The, oil, the jewel looks a lot better, that's for sure. And is it clean? Well, what is that? Do you see that little tiny dot in the middle? Is that dirt? Let's put it on the microscope and look at what's going on with that. <gasps> look at that. It's actually worn away the jewel. Wow, I haven't seen this. So this watch was without oil for so long that the pivot actually wore a part away from the jewel. That can actually affect amplitude and timekeeping, especially on the bottom jewel. So I happen to have a similar Elgin watch that I was working on before that didn't work out from a long time ago when I was first learning. And I'm gonna see if the setting's the same. Well, straight away you can see the setting, um, it doesn't, the 
the jewels, not uh, Ruby, but that doesn't matter. It's really about the size. It's certainly the same type. So I'm gonna get out my micrometer here. This thing's awesome. This is an old school tool, but check out how cool this is. You zero it out by just changing the gear. You open up these little jaws and you can measure jewels or springs or anything. So this is the original. So let's measure it to see how big it is. So as you can see, it's two millimeters and uh, nine one hundredths. So just almost nine one hundredths of a millimeter. And now we can put on the one from the donor and okay, that's close. So this one's a little over 10 and the other one was nine ish. So basically you think in terms of one one hundredth, like you want the fitting to be about a hundredth bigger. I'm talking about a hundredth of a millimeter, by the way, uh, than the setting. So I'm gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna give it a test fit and see if I can make this fit because that is really, really close to being able to fit. And if I can use it, then that would be great because you know I'm assuming this one doesn't have the damaged jewel. I'm gonna have to clean it though because it also needed a clean pretty badly. I'd love it if I can get this thing to work because otherwise I'm gonna have to go scouring eBay for jewels or even just donor movements. So let's take a look at it. Oh yeah, see that's flat. That's much better. It doesn't have that big divot in the middle like the other. So I'm gonna oil it and I'm just gonna give it a shot and see if I can, uh, <laughs> if I can make it work. I think it'll be a tight fit, but that is like just within the tolerance that I would actually expect it to still be able to fit. So there's where it goes. Ooh, it's tight. It looks like it might work. I'm gonna use the peg wood, which is a bit wider. Can it, there we go. Sweet. That is awesome. It does actually fit. Now I'm gonna have to see if the watch will run properly still, because there is another element to these jewels. It's called uh, how it affects the end shake, which is how much the pivot can move up and down in its setting. And if the end shake isn't enough, then it squeezes down on the pivot and it won't even run. And if it's too loose, then it can come out. So I'm just gonna give it a shot and see if it'll run because that'll answer a lot of our questions straight away. Do you wanna run with your brand new jewel? Or your brand new slightly used jewel? Looks like it wants to. Ooh, there we go. Now I haven't tightened down the balance yet. And that's where that end shake issue would show its head if it were to. Like we could see the watch basically come to a stop if the end shake isn't enough. Let's see what it does. Oh, beautiful. It's still running very strong. All right, I'm really happy with that. And now I'm curious to see if that fixes our amplitude problem, I mean, that and the fact that we just serviced the watch and put a new spring in it. Okay, let's see what it can do on the time grapher. Oh, that's so much better. It's within a couple seconds a day and the amplitude's almost 300. That is a fantastic result for this watch. Honestly, that's better than you would assume this watch would be capable of given its age and condition. So I'm thrilled <laughs> to have it back to, to running order like that. And uh, now we can turn our attention to the cosmetics here, the dial, the case, that kind of stuff. And we'll start off with the dial. Again, this is an enamel dial and that actually makes it really easy to clean. I can just use water and this swab here to just take off any little bits of stains or dust or dirt that may have accumulated on it. It'll brighten it up and give it that kind of new shine without overdoing it. And it's basically impossible to take off the printing uh, on watches like this because it's kind of like baked into the enamel. So they tend to clean up really, really well. And I expect this one too as well. And that being said, it's already in good condition. You can see a few hairline fractures on it. That's very, very common for these types of dials and nothing to really concern to be concerned about.
Okay, well, we can continue with the rebuild here now that we've got a running movement. And I'm gonna start by putting on the dial and the hands. This is my hand press tool. So this is the hand from the beginning with that split. And sure enough, it doesn't wanna sit on the hour Hand on the hour wheel where it mounts to. So I'm gonna to try to use a screwdriver, this is a little bit weird, to kind of split the back of it so that I can widen it and there we go and press it down. It actually worked because it would not press down without that. So I'm pretty sure that's a replacement hand but that said, it's probably an Elgin hand and it's actually gorgeous. These are blued steel. They shape and polish these hands and then they're actually put under a flame and uh, steel will turn kind of like a yellow straw color into a kind of a purple brownish, and then it'll turn this deep blue, and then it'll kind of turn black. But look at that blue. That's not a chemical thing. That's not a paint or a treatment or a anything like that. That's naturally, that naturally happens to steel when it's heated to an exact temperature. It's gorgeous. Okay, seconds hand can go on now. And I'm gonna use a piece of Rodico just to lightly clean up the hands. I didn't do any type of restoration work on them. You can polish hands like this and stuff. They can take a polish, but these looked really good to me. And I just didn't feel like I needed to do anything to them. Okay, into the ultrasonic cleaner now goes the case. Um, this one's a little interesting because the case is in, I mean, if you were talking about like, is it in mint condition? No, it's in horrible shape. It's panged up, uh, the, the plating's worn off of it. The crown is worn down. I mean, it's got a lot going on, but that's what makes these watches special. This this is my friend's grandfather's watch, and that this watch was used. It was worn. You can almost feel the person, you know, who wore this and had it in their pocket and dropped it and banged it into doors and, you know, who knows what else happened to this watch. So there's no way I'm going to do anything other than just clean the outside of this, and we'll take a look at it. And yeah, you know, you can see it cleaned up okay. But again, this watch is beautifully worn and to do anything else to it, I think would be criminal. <laughs> uh, so as you can see, it used to have a whole lot, there's where the plating's gone, a whole lot of decorative features on, a, on the case. And most of them are smoothed over or worn over. Now, the one thing though that I do wanna look at is this case back. It is so dinged up that, the, that it's actually touching the movement. So I'm gonna use kind of a crude tool here to just gently try to bend out a few of those, um, yeah, it's my toothbrush, <laughs> a few of those dents so that when I screw it back on, it won't touch the movement and make sure that the moving parts are, because you can see where it has touched the movement and in fact, the movement was rubbing up against it. And uh, I'm just gonna bend it out a little bit and uh, make sure that that's not the case. But I wanna use something like this toothbrush handle, <laughs> it's the only thing I could come up with, that wouldn't leave marks or bend it out in a way that you know ruined the case back or made it so it didn't fit. It just needs a little bit of wiggle room in there, that's it. Okay, so the case, the main part of the case can go on now. And uh, the movement is held in place with a couple of movement screws. Here they are. And those, the job of those is just to keep everything aligned with the case and make sure that the movement doesn't bang around in there. Watch well, cleaned up really nicely. Last but not least, the crystal. As we saw, the crystal that it came with was discolored and cracked and almost certainly not the original crystal anyway. So I've got a nice new one, and I'm gonna use my crystal press tool to install it into the bezel. The aluminum die on the top of this is specially made to kind of grip the outside of a crystal, and so that post that it's going down, it has to be smaller than the crystal so that the crystal wall edges can come down and then I can simply place it in the grooves of that bezel and then undo the top and it, it expands into place. And it's a pretty simple job. Let's see how it looks. Good. 
looking good. Yeah. Quick thumb check just to make sure it doesn't pop out on its own and it looks fine. This air blower I use to make sure that there's no dust, debris, or particles on the dial or on the inside of the crystal. And we can put on the last piece of the puzzle, the bezel with the brand new crystal on there. And this is just looking great. Of course, the actual last part is gonna be the case back in this case. You can see on the case back that it used to have a bunch of design work on it, but this watch has been worn in a pocket for so long that it's almost gone. I think that is so cool. And there we go, the finished product, a beautiful little Elgin pocket watch for my friend's grandfather from 1919, a family heirloom restored, I think properly to its former glory, right? Don't overdo it with this stuff. Don't go polishing and you know, taking stuff off. I don't think that bringing these back to brand new condition is the goal. I think honoring the history and the heritage that they've had is the goal. And uh, hopefully that's what I've done on this one. Thank you so much for joining me for another uh, restoration video here. It really means a lot to me that you spend your time with me and you hang out. If you want to catch up with me on social media, I do have an Instagram account for the channel. It's wristwatch underscore revival. I like to post like, you know, in between project updates or maybe pictures from my watch collection on there. Just, you know, part of the watch community type stuff. So if you're into that, you can head over there and, uh, and say hi. Thank you so much again for hanging out and we'll see you next time.